two powerful kingdoms in, in, uh, in this world, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. God con controls the kingdom of God. Sadly, Satan controls his kingdom. He is a fallen angel, and uh, God's kingdom and Satan's kingdom are both uh, spiritual in nature, and they operate and appeal to the hearts and the minds of men. And a kingdom is composed of, of uh, subjects who are willing, willing to subject to their king. And at the present, there is a great contest taking place between the kingdom of, of God and the kingdom of Satan. The contest uh, of life and service takes place in the hearts and minds of human beings. And, and it, this, is, this contest takes place also for their, their loyalty and, and uh, for, for their loyalty, and, and it's uh, uh, for the will to to, uh, to win them. And this, this contest is so acute that it may be called uh, uh, warfare because it's a spiritual battle, and its outcome will be, uh, be determined by its e eternal destiny, the eternal destiny of the soul, that I should say. And so uh, in both of these kingdoms, there's a desire for the hearts and minds of human beings, and for their loyalty and obedience to these to these two kings, and it's a very difficult thing. In our text, now Jesus tells us that there is a that it, there is a specific way to to follow him, and he says again, enter by the enter by the narrow gate. The old King James calls it the, the straight gate. I'm reading from the New King James, and the straight gate, also referred to as the the straightened way, a very specific way. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many go in by it. Thereby, what happens is, what that means is, that there is a much broader path that uh, that that the majority follow, that the majority of this world always has, and until the end of time, always will follow. You might think of a comparison between uh, I-75 and a little country lane. Going out, going out to a farm, and he says, because narrow is the gate, and difficult, or narrow, or confined, is the way which leads to life, and there are few that find it. We want to be those that find it. That's why God gave us the Bible to, to study it. You can't just take one passage and hang on to it. You compare Scripture with Scripture uh, to come to the understanding that God uh, want, wants us to follow, and it's important. And as I was preparing this lesson, I happened to be over at Blue Springs, and Brother Bill Ferguson made a point that was helpful uh, to to, uh, to my lesson. We talk about uh, the cross of Jesus Christ. We're here to remember that, and we remember that Satan over here is is the uh, the prince of darkness, and he he rules over the kingdom of darkness, and in it are the uh, the children of wrath. And the children of wrath simply mean children of the devil. We'll read about that from the, uh, the Ephesian letter shortly, children of wrath. You don't want to be in this kingdom. You want to flee this kingdom, and you want to come over here, and you want to hear that gospel, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins. It's taught in Luke 13 and 3. You want to make that good confession that Jesus is exactly who he said he was, the Christ, the only begotten Son of God, and you want to be baptized for the remission of your sins. And that's, that puts you under the blood of Jesus Christ and puts you in a saved state. This is what Jesus talked about. This is the path that he want us, uh, want, wants us to follow. And so it's very important that we do that. Now, unlike politics, you, you know, you, you turn on the, uh, the television, it's all about politics right now, as there'll be a presidential election, and um, quite often, and their politics going on, and it, I, I don't know about you all, but it wears me out sometimes. But here's the thing. You can be on the Democrat side, or you can be on the Republican side, or you can be an independent, and uh, right down the middle, and be one of those people that say, I, I vote for the man and not, and not the party. But between these two kingdoms, there are no independents. And, and you need to think about that this morning. You're either in the kingdom of darkness or you're in the kingdom of light. 
and this is the, 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 key, the kingdom of light is, uh, is uh, of course, the kingdom of which Jesus is the head of. And he's in the kingdom of light, and he is the head of the church, and, and, and he cannot be separated from his church, and of course the church is his body. So you're either uh, in this kingdom or that kingdom, there are no in-betweens. And you have to think about that this morning. Every accountable person in the world that is of age uh, is in one of these two kingdoms. And God and Satan are buying for the, the affection and the adoration of every man and uh, woman and child who, who, is, uh, who is of age in this world. And uh, each of them desire, uh, desires for them to be subjects in their respective kingdoms. Satan appeals, again, the prince of darkness, appeals to man by dangling his lust, appealing to man's sense of lust and dangling before him the pleasures of sin and all manners of lust and greed and selfish honors that, that one is always looking to put himself above others. And, and Satan offers things that, that appear fun, but I assure you, they leave you very empty and unfulfilled. They give you a life that is without meaning. But Satan is, is much more successful in his kingdom than in the kingdom of God. Now, I want to remind you that Satan is, is very powerful but he is only allowed to be as powerful as God allows him to be. We need always to remember that. And uh, he is very dangerous, but he is very powerful. And the Bible, uh, again, informs us that there are many on this broad path, this road to destruction, and it's, uh, it's friends, it's family members, it may be even those in, in your household, those that you work with, and, uh, and it's all around you, and we have to navigate this. And there are few, Jesus said, that find this way, that find this path. There will only be a few in it. And, that, you know, sometimes that causes us to, to, to doubt. So these saved are the few. And, and you think, well, can the world be wrong? Well, listen, we are spiritual Israel. I want to talk about a time when God talked to Israel in Deuteronomy uh, chapter uh, 7 and beginning with verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 7 and beginning with verse 6. And he says, for you are a holy people. That means set apart from the world. A holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Get that, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people. Listen to this. For you were the least of all peoples. In other words, the fewest of all peoples. Now, listen. Again, we are spiritual. The New Testament teaches that we're spiritual. Uh, that we are spiritual. Israel is everyone born Gentile or Jew. It doesn't doesn't matter. Or can come into the body when they obey this gospel plan of salvation. When they enter, believe in the Messiahship, and, and and they honor that. And it's very important to do that. And we won't take time to turn there. But that's Romans uh, two and verses twenty-eight and twenty-nine, and Ephesians. 2, 11 through 13, uh, if you'd like to jot that down and consider that later. But verse 8, but because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage. Remember the Israelites were in slavery and this was a type of the slavery of sin that Satan uh, offers. And he says, from the hand of the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh is a, a, is a type of Satan that, that, that was to come. And then verse 9, Therefore, know that the Lord your God, He is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love Him, get that, with those who love Him and keeps His commandments. We talk time and time again. God keeps His covenant. Man does not, not always honor His commitments. God keeps covenant. He will always honor it. Verse 10, And He repays those who hate Him to their face, to destroy them, he will not be slack with him who hates him. He will repay him to his face. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command you today to observe, observe them. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. We're talking about a narrow way. We're talking about a few people in terms of, of, of this world. Now, there will be a lot of people in heaven because there have been many generations and a lot of faithful people 
since the beginning of the world. So don't think that the streets of heaven will be empty. But just remember, in terms of all who have lived, it will be a very small percent percentage. And so the Bible clearly teaches that there must be a distinction between God and his people and Satan and his people. There must be a distinction between these two kingdoms. And um, it, it, uh, there, the, the difference is as, as sharp as the difference between light and darkness, between good and evil, between righteousness and unrighteousness. Satan's kingdom came to existence when he, through pride, rebelled against God, who, who had created all things and, and was cast out of heaven uh, by God. Like notice Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, and beginning with verse 17. The Bible says in Luke 10, and beginning with verse 17. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Now, he sent these 70 out two by two uh, to, uh, to go, and do, uh, go and do the work, and they returned, they were pleased. But he said to them, verse 18, and he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions, and, and over all power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now, this idea, and we'll talk more about it in just a sec, but, but think of the Pharisees and the scribes when you think of serpents here and, and scorpions. You don't have to pick up snakes or pick up scorpions and worship them. This is what Jesus is talking about. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice that your name is written in heaven. That's what matters, that your name is written in heaven. Remember, it was pride that led to Satan's downfall and pride that got him, uh, got him kicked out of heaven. And I want you to remember this, uh, please, out of this lesson. Satan fears, you want to know what Satan's afraid of? He's afraid of when you learn the Word of God, when you discover the Word of God, and you begin to learn the things found therein and begin to set about to understand the things found therein. And, but but when, we are, when we are ignorant of the Word of God, then we're about, that's, that's Satan's most effective we weapon against us. It's when we're ignorant of it, and he can use this against us. We don't want to be a part of that. Now, the power, the power of Jesus' uh, disciples, his followers, had over Satan in this, this text. They were able to cast out uh, uh, demons, and this was proof that that, that Jesus could uh, uh, could defeat Satan. Satan was a defeated being, but he is not yet a totally conquered enemy. He is not yet uh, 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 bound forevermore, thrown into the abominable pit. And so th this action was taken, uh, taken in the name of, of, of Jesus, the Christ, and victory was assured when they went out here. But also in this situation, Jesus was both, uh, uh, he, he was uh, both reminiscing and he was prophesying or teaching. Satan had suffered some major defeats, notably in connection with uh, Jesus' temptation in the, in the wilderness. But Jesus was looking forward again to the final fall of Satan, complete defeat at the hands, uh, at, the, at the hands of Christ. And, it, uh, and, and so in regards to these scorpions, you know, he talked about treading upon scorpions. And uh, again, this was not an inducement to, to handle snakes or anything like that. It, 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 for either the 70 or the or Christians of all the ages to come, but rather it was the affirmation, the affirmation of God's divine providence as exerted upon on behalf of his servants throughout all generations. This symbol, symbolic, symbolically means serpents and scorpions, and it's primarily, in other words, the works of the devil. That's what the Pharisees and the Sadducees engaged in, and it was the, the works of the devil. They were the ones that, that put Jesus to death. And this, this key verse, the last clause is, you know, that nothing shall in any wise hurt you. And this is equivalent to the, pro, the, the, the promise of the Great Commission where Jesus said, Lo, I am, uh, I am with you always, in Matthew 28, verse 20, even until the end of the world, even to the end of the earth. And so a presumption, in other words, something that's not known for certain, on the part of God's children is not to be, uh, is not to be 
grounded in false prophecies, but to be grounded in truth, and we're to be uh, uh, knowledgeable of that. Jesus said, rejoice not, that is, rejoice not in, in any personal victory uh, that you have where you triumph over, uh, over Satan, but rejoice that your name is written down in heaven. The servants of God, uh, his name is inscribed in the Lamb's Book of Life. But also remember, because he's always trying to draw you back to the kingdom of darkness, that your name can be blotted out of the Lamb's Book of Life. Remember that. And please think about that this morning and the condition that, you, that your soul may be in. I hope you give serious thought to that this morning. So Satan's kingdom, uh, I want you to know, is based on usurpation. He wants to usurp the authority of God any way he can. If he can get you to do harm to the church and, and try to change things and move, move things away from the divine pattern, that's Satan using you to usurp God, God's authority to do that contrary to the pattern. Uh, you know, he, 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 he uses usurpation. He, he uses enmity. In other words, a, a deep-treated or a deep-seated and mutual hatred of God and of God's truth. He uses lies. He can be very subtle, and that's what makes him so cunning and dangerous. He is he's full of uh, deceit, and, and he just has all kinds of evil designs. And all of these things will lead to eternal doom and ruin. We have to remember, Satan never created one single thing. Think what all God has created. But Satan has never created one single thing except for confusion. Confusion. If he can confuse the world religiously, and he's done a great job of that, then that's what he's after. And he created confusion, but his reign, remember, will, will end one of these days. Satan is the author of confusion. He masterminds confusion in the religious world by mixing in uh, subtle errors, mixing, mixing truth and error together. When we are ignorant of the Word of God, then he knows that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. It's taught in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 6. But we remember also that the Bible says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 33. Satan is that great mixture of truth. But the end thereof is going to be devastating for him and those who are in his kingdom. Satan is the prince of the power of the air, the Bible says, and, and the, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Notice with me, if you will, go to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll begin with verse 1 there. And it says, And he made, and he made alive, uh, made alive who were dead in trespasses and sin. And this, this, this refers to the, um, uh, the pre-Christian era that he was, or, or the pre-Christian life, rather, for the people at Ephesus. And he's talking to us also. But for the church of Ephesus, he's reminding them that he made them, they were once dead in sin, once in the kingdom of darkness, but he made them alive. And from their trespasses and their sins. Remember, folks, also, that sin, when you think of the word sin, think of that as that which offends God. And through obedience to the gospel, they were able to get forgiveness, just like we can. And he says, verse 2, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. The sons of disobedience, are the children of wrath, we'll see in just a, just a second, son of disobedience, I'll say that right here, uh, verse 3, among whom we all, also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, think of what, what, what you were before you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, think if you're in a lost condition, what you are right now, where we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath the children of the devil, just as others, just as others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, in other words, his pity for sinners, God has pity for sinners and mercy. Verse 5, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by the grace by which you have been saved. This which puts us in a saved condition the few that are willing to follow this, 
they, they have been, grace has been shed upon them. And mercy has been shed upon us, I should say. And in that verse 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. I'll tell you what, we deserve to be the ones that were hung on this cross. And isn't it great this morning that someone took our place and that someone was he who had committed no sin, God's only begotten son. That's grace. That, that's mercy. And verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and not that of yourselves. It is the gift of God. This also must be an obedient faith. Remember this. We get grace when we conduct ourselves obedient to the word of God, obedient to the truth. Verse 9, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Listen. This idea from the Greek of good works implies our duty. Our duty. We have a duty. We need to be committed, which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk, that we should walk in them. The, the children of God need to separate themselves. We need to inspect ourselves. Consider ourselves, consider our influence and the lives we're living. We need to make sure we separate ourselves. We need to continually be, do be doing this, examining ourselves, that we are separated from Satan and from his works. We need to be delivered from Satan's controlling power, just like the lost need to be delivered, uh, need to be delivered from Satan's controlling power in their lives and be lost, but you maintain this. We resist the devil. We draw nigh unto God, as the scripture says, that the devil may flee from us. And you know, on the other hand also, the, the kingdom of God is based upon his sovereignty. We talk about that sometimes. That means his uh, supreme power or, or authority and his holiness, uh, his truth, his love, his righteousness, and, and, and his creative and, and, and eternal power. It is eternal. God's power is eternal. It will never end, and Satan will never get the upper hand upon God. We can have great confidence in that. And the kingdom of God has the qualities of God's kingdom that, that, that we need in our life. Love, joy, peace, obedience, righteousness in the Holy Spirit. These qualities will be an essential part of the character and the conduct of of the individual, as the, the, the individual who is a citizen of the kingdom, affecting his and her entire life and conduct. Citizens, see, when we become saved, we are citizens of the kingdom of which Christ is the light, of which Christ is the head of, because he bought and paid for it with his body. Remember this too. We, we, we have those among us who want to be like the religious world. They, 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 you know, Israel wanted a king. God was their king. They wanted a king. They wanted to be like everybody else. And God allowed them to have a succession of kings. And in many cases, that was a total disaster. A total disaster. We want to be like the religious world. To be allowed to be half-hearted. To be lukewarm. If we've got something that sounds a little more fun on the Lord's Day, we've cast aside our commitment to God, and we'll go off and have that fun. What's even more fun, is it, uh, or uh, more uh, incredible to me, I should say, is then they'll post it on Facebook, so all kinds of pictures. Look here, we're not at church, or we're not in a place that a Christian ought to be, and we got, we've got pictures to prove it, and we're proud of it. That's just, what the, that's just what the devil wants you to do. That's just exactly what he wants you to do. That tickles him to death. He hates you. He hates me. He hates the church. He despises Christianity. And if he can get you to just be lukewarm and introduce that sin into your life, and allow that sin to creep back in there to, to before you know it, you're following him rather than God, that's just exactly what he wants you to do. Your job is to do your duty, to honor your commitment, and not allow that to happen to you. And it's, it's very important that we do this. Listen, 
a citizen of the kingdom cannot be uh, in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan at the same time. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon. mammon. In other words, you can't serve uh, material things. That's uh, Matthew 6, 24, by the way. A person must change masters if they truly wish to serve God and enjoy uh, time with Him in this life and eternal bliss and look for the day when He comes back and we go to meet Him in the air. You can't have it both ways. You can't if you are lukewarm, as Jesus talked about in the Revelation letter, you are trying to serve two masters. And he said, I won't have you. I won't have you in my kingdom. He said, oh, I wish that you were either cold or hot. Either cold or hot, either in or out. But because you are lukewarm, I will, the new King James says, vomit you out of my mouth. I will vomit you out of my mouth. You will not be in two kingdoms. You cannot straddle the fence. You cannot be an independent like they do in politics. And we have to remember that. We have to remind ourselves, deliverance from sin, folks, is a basic fundamental and a bust for everyone who would be saved and who, would, who, who are determined to go to heaven and to live the Christian life. Now, I've visited a lot of sick people lately, the last few weeks, more, more than usual. Sick unto death. Let me tell you, you're laid on your sick bed, sick unto death. You really don't care what's going on in this world. You're not concerned about what the, whether the what Kentucky Wildcats are winning or not. You know, I've never had I've never had one soul laid on their deathbed said how the Wildcats do it. You ever had that happen? Never. They don't care that Jason Aldean is down here up here at Rupp Arena or down here at the Corbin Arena. They don't care about the things of this world. All of a sudden, they're focused on eternity. But my point is, don't wait till you get to your deathbed. Lay up your treasures in heaven. You send your treasures on ahead. And when you go to meet the Lord, you're going to get a return on that investment. An invest, investment that is out of this world and that we can't even comprehend the greatness of it. How important that that is. It means everything. It means everything. Focus on what's important. Now, is there anything wrong with watching the ball game? I don't mean that. But I, I'm just telling you that those things don't mean, that in the final analysis, in the, in the times of eternity, those don't mean anything. They don't mean a thing. A person must change masters if he truly wishes to serve God and enjoy uh, and, and enjoy eternal bliss with Him. Uh, and again, uh, th this this is deliverance from sin is what it takes to live a Christian life to use the the tool of repentance that God has given us. You know, light and darkness are opposites. Everybody knows that. Godliness and ungodliness are opposites, aren't they? Righteousness and unrighteousness have nothing in common. We have to remember that. Let me say that again. Righteousness and unrighteousness have nothing in common. I want to look at one less passage before we quit. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and about verses 17 and 18. Second Corinthians chapter 6. Yeah. In verse 17 there, the Apostle Paul writes to the congregation at Corinth and to the church and to the endless ages of time until the end of the world. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Look at your life. Are you a separate people from the influences of the lost around you? Are you navigating, following that narrow path Navigating your way through this life, that's our job, that's our duty, to navigate, to learn with this sin all around us, and wicked people, and even people, evil people, and some, like I said, in our own household that we work with, go to school with, we're to be a separate people for them. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, God said, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? Says the Lord Almighty. Finally, and in closing. 
what prevented the, the Corinthians? Uh, here's what, the reason I read that passage. What, what uh, uh, prevented the Corinthians from opening their hearts and being the kind of Christians that they are to be? I'll tell you just exactly, because we still have that same problem today. A divided allegiance. A divided allegiance attached to the things of this world and the kingdom of darkness and trying to, trying to walk in this world also, trying to walk in this kingdom. These two kingdoms are not in fellowship with each other. These two kingdoms cannot walk together. There is no way that they can. These two kingdoms must be as separated as the east is from the west. You know, some in the Corinthian church were forming dangerous associations. Their friendships, think about this, your friendships, the people that, you know, bad is a strong influence on you. Evil, evil lives, evil people are bad influences on you. There are people you probably don't need to be around. That doesn't mean that you can't love them. That doesn't mean that you can't say hello to them. But there are people you probably don't need to be around. They're non-Christians. And what happens is, because they live in this kingdom of darkness, and they're children of the devil, children of wrath, they will weaken you. And it will continue till they destroy you, and you, and you will fall away from the Lord. Been a many a person. I'm probably speaking to someone that has fallen away from the Lord this morning, or has never obeyed the gospel. If you're here this morning, and that's the case, the Bible teaches us that we have written up on the board, and I've already given the plan of salvation. I won't go through it again, but I'll tell you this. You can be baptized in a matter of, a matter of minutes. The water's ready. There's towels and a change of garments back there, and you can be washed in the blood of the Lamb. If only you'll follow this plan of salvation, and we will help you, be glad to help you to do this, and we'll baptize you immediately, and your name will be written, inscribed, in the Lamb's Book of Life. You've done that. But you've drifted too far from the shore. And you know you have. Won't you get honest with yourself, honest with God? Get your courage up and return to the shepherd and bishop of your soul, having the faithful pray with you and for you on your behalf. God sees true repentance in your heart. He will apply the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ to your soul. If you're subject to the gospel, please won't you come. Always stand and sing the song of invitation.